Well, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about anything and everything Beatles. Could be any part of their past, what's going on today, and even into the future sometimes. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the four regular co-hosts of this show. And you might know my other Beatles program that's heard on uh, several different channels and can be heard on the internet called Every Little Thing. Being joined by my other regulars, first of all, longtime writer for Beatle Fan Magazine, that being Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And also a writer for Beatle Fan and lots of other music publications, author of several Beatle books, too. Uh, we have Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. Also, we have a longtime writer for lots of Beatle articles. You know him for many years with uh, Beatles Examiner. And we actually have some gigantic news to say about him. <laughs> we welcome Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. You want, me to, got... you, want, you want me to say it or do you want to say it? You all right, say I'll it. say it. I'll say it. First of all, we congratulate Steve because mm -hmm. no sooner does Beatles Examiner end then Billboard magazine gobbles up Steve Marinucci, and he's now Gobble he's now it. a writer. <laughs> Snags him as yes. a writer for Billboard. So uh, congratulations, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, I should let me clarify that I'm a contributor to Billboard. I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, a staff member per se, but I am a contributor, and I'm also going to be writing for. Access.com, which actually is an examiner, uh, is owned by the same company, but I'm going to be doing some work for them. And I'm also going to be blogging on my own. And who knows what else is going to happen. There may be other things going on. It's all, this is all too new yet. Uh, you know, I haven't, had, the dust has barely settled, but. Although your first piece for, uh, for Billboard has already appeared. It has, and it had a. A lengthy quote from somebody on this panel. So there we go. Oh, that's that right. To which, to which I thank you, Mr. Cozen. That was uh, that really was very helpful. Anytime. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So all of us extend our congratulations to you. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank and, you, guys. Uh, yep. Look forward to many more articles in Billboard and elsewhere. And elsewhere. And uh, also, we have a special guest with us on the show, and that is Alan Haber. And Alan programs a wonderful music channel that you can find on the internet called purepopradio.com. Uh, apart from the fact that Pure Pop Radio programs this show and uh, also my other Beatles show, Every Little Thing, um, this, this, uh, this music site plays incredible music. Uh, it's really hard to define. I don't know if you want to call it power pop or not, but it's, it's strong melodic music. It's taking all the music that we love from, say, the 60s and 70s that had the hallmarks of that kind of music, great melodies, great lyrics, harmonies, all of that, plays some of that music and mixes it with the music that followed in the decades since. And Alan does an amazing job programming this channel. So uh, first of all, we welcome Alan to our show. Thanks very much, Ken. Hi, guys. It's great to be here. Thanks for having hey. me. Welcome, Alan. Thank you. So we're going to be talking about uh, the music that you program on the channel and the channel itself. And we also did uh, a show several months back on Beatles music. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of the way that Alan programs the channel, he certainly can add a lot of other artists that we didn't even mention that we don't even know about. Because <laughs> he, he lives and breathes this stuff. Yeah. You know, and you can tell that this is a passion for him. So um, before we do that, I just wanted to bring up two very quick news items. And first of all, there's news about Ringo, who has now added brand new dates for the next leg of his tour with the same band. And Steve, you want to comment about that? He's got uh, a bunch of dates. Uh, he's got uh, some dates in America, and then he's going to do, uh, I believe it's eight dates in Japan. So he's going to, he's, and uh, it's basically starting in October, uh, what he's going to be doing. So, Well, from what we I saw from, from your article, there are five dates and they're all on the West Coast. Right. So there's nothing on the East Coast planned at the moment right. or anywhere else in the country. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, yeah. it's, it's still the same band. He loves mm -hmm. this band. 
Yes, he does. So, um, but yeah, he's going to, he's got those dates and, and they, as usual, they, they always say that there may be more dates and it's very possible that there could be, but uh, uh, for now, that's where, that's where things sit. So, okay. The other thing I wanted to mention was that there was an interview with Paul McCartney in the Washington Post, and it had a few tidbits of information in there, including the subject of pure McCartney was brought up. And Paul does admit that the reason why there are no songs from Flowers in the Dirt in there is because of the remasters coming out and the box set. He actually admits it in the in the interview. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. he does say that there are some of the demos that he made with Elvis Costello, and he presented it to Elvis, and in Paul's own words, Elvis was tickled pink. My impression was that it was like most of the demos or all of them, I thought. Uh, but maybe yeah. I was just reading too hopefully into the Yeah, piece. Me, me too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope so. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to get my hopes too high, though. Because uh, when it comes to the audio on these remasters, I always feel like he could have given more. Yeah. Most of the time. Yeah. But uh, it would be nice. I mean, many of us have followed, if you know, some of the bootlegs that have come out. There was one with, it was all Paul and Elvis and songs that were not released on either Paul's albums or Elvis's albums. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to have those in there, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll have to wait and see. So anyway, Alan Haber, why don't we talk about Pure Pop Radio? Um, Apart from my initial comments, why don't they come from you, since you're the one who originated the channel? How would you explain the channel to people who are not familiar with it? Well, you kind of summed it up pretty well before, Ken. The the whole point of the channel is to spotlight melodic music. Um, Mm. I call it melodic pop, but... I, I, it's some of its power pop, if you want to call it that, but it, it is a little bit over all over the map. But all the songs share a strong melody um, center, so uh, you'll hear country on there, you'll hear rock, you'll hear pop, uh, you'll hear a lot of things. You'll hear a lot of sort of old timey music, even forties or fifties sounding, on occasion. Mm. But they all share melody, so that that's the key. Um, you know, when I started this. 21 years ago, it was a weekly show, and it evolved into what it is today, which is a 24-hour station. So uh, there's about 9,100 songs about uh, in various states of rotation on there and special shows like, of course, Things We Said Today and Every Little Thing and some other things as well. Um, And they all share that center, uh, very, very strong melodies. And that's what it's about. If people want to go to purepopradio.com, you can read what's been added to the station, reviews of new music. There's lots of new music, uh, very strong in melody coming out, and um, that music is being added to the station's playlist. And you'll see reviews and thumbnails of the album covers, also articles. Uh, There's a series called I Love That Song, and I have uh, essays uh, about specific melodic pop songs through the years i love that album that's that's a little uh offshoot from that and uh, all sorts of other things so it's it's a good source if people like that kind of music yeah i know there's a lot of people who grew up on 60s and 70s rock and and as radio changed and became more specialized and maybe they became more uh you know further and further away from what terrestrial radio was doing and they didn't know where to turn and Mm -hmm. The computer is confusing because there's a gazillion channels out there Mm -hmm. and they're becoming more and more specialized. I think the people that grew up on a lot of that music that we talk about here that we love would certainly love what you're doing. Well, thanks, Ken. I I mean, you know, there is so much music coming out. I, I feature so many indie pop artists who are doing that kind of stuff. You could call it Beatlesque. There's a lot of McCartney esque type stuff. And it's been like that through all the years I've been doing this. The problem is, is if you're just an average music listener, how do you know where to go to find it? So stations like mine offer that option. You know, it's kind of a one-stop shop for people who like melodic pop songs. And most terrestrial stations wouldn't even play what you're touching. Oh, no, mm. no, 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 no. The, uh, you know, the, there are some if, you, if, if uh, smaller stations that aren't hooked into corporate uh, radio companies 
that uh, might play some of this stuff, but basically they're few and far between. It's mostly on the internet that this stuff is being played, if it's being played at all. And mm. my whole thing is to give a voice to these indie artists who perform this kind of music because it's hard to find out about them otherwise. Because the internet is so massive and huge, you know, it's very hard. How do you know even what to look for if you mm -hmm. don't know about this kind of stuff? So um, that's been my passion for a long, long time. Um, right. You know, and um, I, I love doing it. I do. And it shows. Thanks. All right. So why don't the rest of you uh, ask Al on the question? Why don't we start with Al? Uh, matter of fact, I can put in a little bit of a plug for those of us who do a lot of listening, either on tablets or an iPhone, and you know, especially walking around, things like that. Not only is the station available just on a regular or just strictly on the Internet itself, but also if uh, for people who have the app called TuneIn Radio. Alan's uh, station, Alan Haber. It's in fact, if you do a search for Alan Haber's Pure Pop Radio, you know, don't just put Pure Pop Radio. Do Alan Haber's Pure mm -hmm. Pop Radio. It'll come up, and yeah. uh, it's uh, it's. I, I'm very sorry that I haven't uh, discovered it until just really the last couple of days, because it's right in my wheelhouse of uh, uh, you know the kind of stuff that I that I really enjoy. Oh, great. Well, that's terrific. Yeah. I guess the, 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 the main question is, especially with maybe some of the newer stuff, is where do you hear this? <laughs> well, you know, I do this basically full time. So yeah. half, half or a quarter of every day pretty much is looking for stuff. And it's just mm -hmm. looking, you know, I mean, I've been doing it a long time, so I know certain places to go to. Uh, and plus, I have a lot of people who point me in certain directions. Maybe I miss something. Um, so people will recommend artists to me, and then I listen to them, and you know, I see artists that are recommended if you like this artist. And you know, a lot of it doesn't fit, um, especially in the last maybe year. I've grown so much that... I get a lot of emails, uh, you know, hi, I play such and such, and it's usually blues or heavy metal or rap or mm. you know, something that I wouldn't have anything to do with. But that's okay because, because it, out of, say, 10 or 15 or 20, there might be one or two that fit the format. So um, I, I never say no to anything unless I know it's not for me. Or for the station, rather. So um, it's going to websites. It's it's uh, people saying, "Hey, check this guy out," and going from there. It, it's a lot of different ways. Uh, but um, you know, I couldn't really do it as well as I do it without the internet. Uh, the internet has been incredibly helpful, and um, uh, you know, and plus I've I've got a lot of contacts from doing this so long. So that's basically where I hear it. You know, I, I do it a lot of my time so um i'm bound to find some and i'm finding 10 or 15 things a week usually uh that are good so it works uh along with the you know the the newer stuff this afternoon for instance i heard a version by paul williams of a song called Someday Man, which probably Steve may be the only one of us who who really who really knows that song. Because oh, no, 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 monkeys, no, no. Monkeys, no. Monkeys, yeah. monkeys, right. monkeys did that. Right. Exactly. On the, the present album, you know, the last album they did as a as a trio before yeah. before Michael Nesmith left. And um I to be honest, I had forgotten that Paul Williams wrote it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you know, I, I've I've made a special effort over the years to investigate catalogs. If I didn't already have that stuff, and I've been, you know, like you guys, I've been collecting music since I was, you know, a wee lad. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have, uh, for many many artists, I have very deep uh, most of their catalogs. And Paul Williams is a favorite artist of mine from the beginning. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I had all that stuff already. But, you know, uh, one of the things that I, I try to do is not only feature the original versions of certain songs, but covers of those songs 
that are done through the years uh, to kind of mm. tie the decades together. You know, a good song's a good song, no matter what decade it comes from. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, an artist like Ken, you were playing uh, the Bell Furies uh, right. on uh, Every Little Thing. And um, that was She's a Woman, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, obviously it's decades and decades after that. So a good song's a good song, and a good melody's a good melody. So I try to stick with that. Well, I found out about the Bell Furies from hearing it on your channel. Right, right, <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, that, I mean, that's a long answer, I guess, to your question, Al. No, that's, uh, that's absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. But that's, that shows you the, how, just how, how deep you know, your, your playlist, if you want to call it a playlist, how deep it goes. Mm. Where you know you, you come up with a you know the ri the original version of a of a of a monkey of a not terribly well known monkey song by its composer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I try. I, there's a lot of that kind of stuff in there too. Um, and and it, like I say, there's about 9,100 or so songs up there that mm. vie for attention, and they get rotated around and um, to keep everything sounding fresh. Um, but there, there, there's quite a bit of that. There's pretty much every category you could think of up there, uh, originals mm -hmm. and covers through the decades, and uh, a lot of you know a lot of stuff that's just coming out now that's totally original. Although they tip their hat to you know older stuff. Sure. Someday Man is one of my favorite Monkey songs, Al. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great oh, there one. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not one that, that a lot of people know actually. Mm. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great song. Alan, how about you? Um, okay, I have a, a kind of nuts and bolts question. Um, I, I think a lot of people are confused about the differences between terrestrial radio and internet radio, and and they're you know we've talked about it a lot among ourselves, and uh, mm. you know sometimes it's hard to figure out how you you know whether you can play a certain amount of music or not or uh, what, what in practical terms just as someone who operates this kind of thing is is the difference and what are the constraints do you feel constrained at all or or are you now so used to dealing with it that it's it's just completely second nature well it, it's kind of a yes and no and yes answer uh, <laughs> to that it, it's pretty complicated these days because there are all sorts of rules that webcasters or internet broadcasters have to follow. Um, there's something called the DMCA rules, which specifies the number of songs you can play from a particular artist in a three hour period or from an album or a compilation in a three hour period. Um, so there, there are those rules. Plus there's the, uh, there's the issue of paying royalties and that is up in flux now because of the differences in what small webcasters can afford to pay and what over the air or so-called terrestrial stations can afford to pay or even satellite like Sirius XM. Um, so uh, it's really in flux as far as the rules are concerned. But, you know, the main difference is that you'll find uh, many radio stations, well, fewer in these days, since the um, uh, the cost of paying royalties has gone up so much, um, that um, terrestrial broadcasters will simulcast their signal on the Internet. So you can hear them on the Internet. And sometimes the commercials are different from the ones that they play over the air. It's kind of complicated there. You know, you might have a local advertiser who doesn't want to advertise to the world because there's no reason why somebody in Australia needs to buy a hammer from a hardware store <laughs> in Poughkeepsee, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then there are, there are also other things, too, other considerations uh, at play. But, um, I mean, those are the, those are the basic differences. The, the main difference for me is that some people may think that these rules are, are hard and make it harder to do uh, Internet radio, but actually I kind of think they make you work harder as a programmer. Um, because you have to think about how many songs can you play um, in a three-hour period. And, uh, you know, you want to steer clear of that because you can open yourself up for fines and all sorts of issues. 
So uh, I, I think it makes for better programming, especially during a closed show uh, like a Every Little Thing or I have another a show called Needle Meets Vinyl where all the mm -hmm. songs are played from vinyl records. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if the guy who does that show um, plays four songs by the Beatles, I have to get him to cut one or I have to cut it because it has to stick at three. So it actually makes you think a little harder to program uh, different artists or maybe artists that are like-minded to the ones that you would like to play four songs from but can't. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Did I answer? Did I answer the question? Yeah, um, you know, but it it kind of you know I think back to when I was a kid listening to the radio and especially at the beginning of FM and and say when the White Album came out. I mean, it was really kind of a a big a big thrill when one of the stations would get the White Album would play a whole side of it and then maybe mm. an hour later would play another whole side of it and. Uh, it, it seems like in a way, you know, all of these rules kind of, you know, I, I see what you're saying about sort of making you think creatively about how to how to get a good mix. But, mm -hmm. you know, the the possibility of there being a special occasion, you know, something coming out where you'd want to play the whole thing. It, it, it feels like the rules are a little onerous there to me. Yeah, you can't do that anymore. I mean, you will find stations doing that all the time. They're not supposed to, but you can't do that anymore now. I would like to on occasion. I mean, I used to do, when I had my weekly show, I used to do sometimes two weeks in a row with a specific artist and play maybe a total of 15 or 20 songs. And they talk about them. I, mean, I did two weeks in a row with Joey Moland. Or mm -hmm. uh, I did two weeks in a row with Graham Gouldman and Kevin Godley from 10CC. And we played tons of stuff, but I couldn't do that same interview with him today. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's just kind of the way it is. I mean, I'd like to be able to do it on occasion, but, you know, kind of hampered there. And it explains why, if anyone listens to Every Little Thing, they'll notice that I never play more than four songs from the Beatles in one hour. Mm -hmm. But I'm allowed to play four Beatles songs, four solo John, four solo Paul. I can play all the cover versions I want. Right of Beatles songs, uh, novelty records, tribute songs, family members, but never more than four from the same artist. So it does force you to be creative, like, like Alan said. Yeah, and, you know, and, and then uh, listeners get to hear different stuff, whereas you might want to play six songs or eight songs from the Beatles. Um, so there are pluses and minuses to the rules, but um, got to live with them, so, you know. Yeah. Are these internationally enforced, or is it a particularly American rule? Well, now you're getting into a whole other, a whole other area. No, that those are the DMCA rules are for the United States. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of the great old days in when, when in England they had pirate radio, having a ship just offshore, do, breaking mm -hmm. the rules. You know? Well, <laughs> it, 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 yeah, I mean, it would be like today, like if Scott Muni was doing things from England on WNEW, he'd say. And now it's things from England, but only three songs. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, right. He'd, have to, he'd have to codify it. But, um, yeah, the rules of the international, if you're living in a country, you're held by the rules in that country. It's very complicated, but, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. <laughs> Steve? Um, Alan, let me let me um, go back in history a little bit. How did What gave you the idea to start? pure pop radio and and what music especially i mean obviously the beatles had a lot to do with it but i mean who else besides the beatles really provided the the um impetus for doing it well you know it's it's interesting just to kind of give you the reader's digest condensed version uh when i started doing shows in 1994 i did a show called um lost treasures and guilty pleasures and the idea was to kind of raid my collection and play stuff that was really never heard or that, you know, B-sides and deep album tracks that you never knew one off, stuff like that. And I went through the stuff that I wanted to play so fast that I kind of killed the format. Mm. So, so I moved from that. And Ken, you're going to find this impossible to believe, but mm. I did an all Beatles show after that for about six Why? or eight months. And uh, Why is that impossible? Because... I, I stopped doing it because I got, I got kind of bored. 
um, you know, just sort of playing the same things over and over again. Um, and plus, there weren't new releases coming out by the four Beatles so uh, all that often. So um, I wanted to, to do something that kind of reflected my overall view of the kind of music I really liked. And uh, I started putting together a format without knowing what to call it. Because I said, well, geez, what is this? Is this? I didn't even know what power pop really be- was because the online uh, movement of power pop aficionados was just starting at that point. So um, I, I kind of thought about it and I said, well, geez, it sounds like pure pop music to me. And then I thought of Nick Lowe's album uh, in England called Pure Pop for Now People, or mm-hmm. in America, rather. Uh, and um, I thought, well, geez, pure pop. I, I'm sure Nick wouldn't mind if I used that. So that's where I got the name for it. And I thought that, you know, I started to say, well, geez, these songs are all like two and a half, three minutes. Um, Or at least they were at at that point. And um, that's how it started. And I just kind of get piling on. And I read some of the specialist uh, little small uh, magazines that were out there that catered to this kind of music and found out about new artists that I hadn't heard of before. And it just escalated from there. So that's how it started. So if you in 1994 was this an internet show or was it a terrestrial radio show? Well, it was 95 that I started Pure Pop and um at the time I I was at a um a non-commercial uh, cable radio station of all things. There weren't that many of them in the United States and um the guy who ran it said, "You know, I this thing called the internet and people are simulcasting their, their programming, we should do that too. So it started off where I was just playing to the cable audience, uh, anybody who subscribed to the cable company, mm-hmm. and then they brought on the simulcast on the internet, and then um, you know, I was off to the races. It was a whole different thing then. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's there are just so many, so much great music between you know that uh, that you could pick from. Who are who are your top ten favorites? If you can if you can do that. Well, a lot of the B groups, you know, of course, Beatles, Beach Boys, Birds, um, Raspberries, um, you know, all all that all that kind of stuff. Um, all the solo Beatles stuff. Um, you know, as I said, I did an old Beatles show before then, so it was easy to to integrate all of that. And Ten CC would be another one. Paul Revere and the Raiders. You know, all that '60s stuff because that's when I that's when I was growing up with radio and. I lived on Long Island, and I listened to WABC AM, and, you know, they played, I loved everything that they played. Uh, you know. mm-hmm. so, Just uh, like me. Yeah, there you go. So I I, uh, I enjoyed all, all that music, and I thought, well, if I can take that as a core and build on it and add current indie pop artists, and really at the time, there really weren't all that many of them, but it was like the floodgates opened, and all of a sudden you started hearing about recording artists that nobody would heard of before because they had no outlet you know they would just play a show locally at a borders books and they would have a and in those days it was all almost all cassette um which was very hard to program off of boy i don't mm-hmm. i don't miss those days um yeah. but but that's how it started and it just snowballed from there and word got out and at the time it was me and a guy in france uh, who is still doing his show just like I am. So we were the only two. And now there's a whole bunch. But um, uh, it took off. It was like wildfire. Wow. Thank, thank you. Sure. You're welcome. Alan, why do you suppose? I mean, there was a period of time where a lot of this very poppy music kind of became less and less in vogue. You know, it wasn't really played on, on commercial terrestrial radio. Why do you suppose that is? Well, because, you know, it has to do with uh, uh, people working at record companies and focus groups and record companies pushing certain artists and, 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 and all of that. And, and you know, the kind of, this kind of music just wasn't, like you say, just, just wasn't fashionable. But what happened at the same time or, or on the other, at the other side of the coin was that it started taking off exponentially on the Internet because all of a sudden there was a place to hear this kind of music because there were radio stations and shows popping up that weren't broadcasting over the air. You know, you could have a station that played polka music for 24 hours a day, anything you wanted. You weren't, mm-hmm. you, weren't um, uh, you know, kept back 
by any group, you know, whatever you want, you can do. Um, so, you know, for me, it just seemed natural because I love this music to begin with. And I was resourceful enough to find enough artists to make something out of it. And, you know, like I say, it was, it was a one and then a two hour show every week for years and years and years. And then I said, you know, I should do this 24 hours a day and it became a station. And now, you know, there's just, the internet's just crawling with things like this. So that's what it is you know it just you know i mean the archie sugar sugar is one of my favorite records pop records of all time it's just so simple and so catchy I, I i i love it but you you won't hear it on a terrestrial radio station i don't know if you even hear it on sirius xm um so it's up to internet broadcasters who specialize in the kind of music that a certain person likes to play that kind of thing and keep that kind of music alive. And, you know, that's what I do. Um, Alan, let me, uh, let me ask if you think all the recent um, stuff with the 1972, with the pre 1972 royalty, has that really screwed things completely for broadcasters? I mean, I, I guess the answer is obvious, but is that going to work itself out? Is, is there, is it going to work out for you? Well, should explain what that is. Yeah. Yeah, it's me. It's music recorded before 1972 that weren't subject to royalties being paid before, mm -hmm. um, and that was one of the, you know, quirks of the of the copyright law. Yeah, it hasn't really affected internet broadcasters yet. It certainly affected Sirius XM to the tune of millions of dollars. But um, I think that that basically to make sort of an overall point about it is that all of this stuff, all of these rules, all of this contention, all of this trying to squeeze blood from a stone uh, as far as royalties are concerned and what have you, it's going to have to work itself out. A at some point it has to because there's too much opportunity here. I don't think it's going to be anytime soon, but um, at some point it will have to work itself out because the alternative is that it goes away. And there's mm -hmm. no internet broadcasting, and if that happens, then you're stuck with the local hit stations and, you know, 25 songs in a row that all have the same pre-programmed beat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's not good for anybody. You need diversity. You need uh, different sounds playing so to give people the option <laughs> to listen to something other than what they can hear on over-the-air radio, which is always going to be like that, unfortunately. So... I, I, it's going to work itself out. I just couldn't tell you when. I don't know. Do you think that internet radio is going to be the most viable way now for radio to to survive? Or um, I mean, obviously, I'm sure you'd like it to be. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I'm sure you have a preference that way. But because terrestrial radio is so constrained in its programming, do you think more and more people are turning to internet radio and and it can make enough money for the people who are programming the channels to keep it going? Well, yeah, you know, that's another bunch of questions there. Can it make money? I think at some point it will. Right now, no. Uh, it really doesn't make money for anybody, um, any small webcasters, I should say. Um, mm -hmm. Those of us who do it on a long-term basis do it for the love of it. You know, so, uh, yeah, I think I, it would be nice if that was, uh, if, if stations were on the Internet were able to be paid for the work that they do. But um, right now, no, not even for the foreseeable future. It's, they got to they gotta fix the royalty rates issues before they turn their heads to this, you know. It's very complicated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Al? So, um, uh, going back to your comment about Sugar Sugar, where do you stand on Stars on 45? I have a, pretty, <laughs> I, I have a big note here to mention that, actually. <laughs> I, it's a good thing you asked, Al, because I, I actually, I got to tell you, I have a pretty sizable collection of Stars on 45 CDs. Um, I, don't listen to the, I don't listen to them all the time. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know what? I think they're fun for what they are. Um, the, the ones that, that are uh, not the copy, you know, the copy uh, medleys, 
like mm-hmm. Holly Days for the Hollies and the Beatles stuff, and there's a bunch of others that, you know, it depends on how skillfully they were put together in the first place. You know, I, I could do without it. I could do with it. It really depends on my mood. I, I quite I think they're fun to listen to. I, gotta, I have to be honest with you. I do. But um, they're not high art. They won't replace mm. the originals, you know. But if you're at a party, um, that's a good thing to put on. I think people would enjoy, you know, having it on in that kind of a circumstance. But, um, you know, it, it's for what it is, I, I think it's fun. It has a purpose. Um, Alan, w- when we began talking uh, actually a while ago about uh, having you on the show, um, it was, as as Ken said, right after we had the show about groups that people would like if they like the Beatles or, or groups that are obviously influenced by the Beatles. And uh, uh, I was just wondering if you had some contributions to that list that uh, perhaps we hadn't thought about i do actually have quite a bit of it but um i'll hit some of the high points here i'll start off with the uh, the only really commercial uh, artist that i've got on this list here and um that would be america and specifically mm-hmm. one album from 1974 holiday which uh from the songs on there written by jerry beckley and dan peak are basically just a veritable tribute to everything that people like about Paul McCartney's music, mm-hmm. um, especially Jerry Beckley's stuff. Um, songs like uh, What Does It Matter, Baby It's Up To You, Mad Dog, you know, it just doesn't get much better than that. Um, mm-hmm. they're, they're very McCartney-esque songs, and uh, of course George Martin produced the album, Sir George, and um, arranged it, and so it's it's got all that. Jeff Emmerich engineered it. Uh, so you put all those elements together, it's basically a love letter to the melodic sort of mid-tempo uh, to ballad uh, sides of McCartney. Mm-hmm. And actually, later on, Daisy Jane is very McCartney-esque. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Beckley's, Beckley's music was always very McCartney-esque. Um, it, it still is uh, today. And, uh, I mean, I, I leave... Dewey Bunnell out of the equation there because his stuff really doesn't hit those notes for me. But um, mm. Be- Beckley's always does, and especially on that album. That album's just killer. Um, I-, I love the songs on there. So if you're looking for a McCartney-esque sound boy, uh, just go to the Holiday album from America. Mm-hmm. It's just great. But in in the you probably haven't heard of it before area. I've got a, a lot of stuff here. Um, a group called the Beatifics, uh, and this goes back to 1996. And I realized a lot of the stuff I picked was from the mid 90s to around 1999, just by mm-hmm. chance. Um, I didn't design it that way. But uh, they had an album called uh, the Beatifics and How I Learned to Stop Worrying. And there's a lot of McCartney-esque stuff on there. And a song called Something Anything, Something Slash Anything, very, very, very McCartney-esque with a George Harrison-y slide guitar bit. Um, So Uh you get the best of both worlds there. Just a great, upbeat pop song. And it's got a very um, uh, Harrison-esque cold ending to it. Uh, Great song and a great group called the Beatifics. Um, uh, around a guy mm. named Chris Dorn. I don't know if he's still doing anything. Out of Minneapolis. And then a group called the Greenberry Woods. And uh, this is also uh, from the mid-90s. Uh, a song called uh, Backseat Driver from an album called Big Money Item. That's very Paul McCartney. It's virtually a rewrite and a love letter uh, of Paperback Writer. Uh, it's got that same vibe to it. And um, it just sounds like a Beatles outtake. Uh, through and through uh, they went on to uh change the type of music they did they changed their name to splitsville and now they're doing a whole other thing there's a uh, twin brothers in there um and they have a solo or a twin act now but um back when they were uh, greenberry woods they were very very beatlesque so uh that's that's another cool. great one uh another one you probably haven't heard of uh, is a group called vinyl kings and I, I think they were out of Nashville. They only made two albums, and they were basically uh, a studio, a, a group of studio musicians who liked to hang around and kind of play songs that were in the style of their favorite groups. 
And the first album they did in 2002 is called A Little Trip. And in fact, the song A Little Trip, which leads off the album, is not a, only a love letter to the spirit of the Beatles. We, you, you'd swear McCartney was playing the bass on it. Um, hmm. uh, uh, the guy who's singing it, he's, uh, he's talking about a father asking his son what he wanted to be when he grew up. And uh, the kid decides on rock and roll when he saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and took a trip straight into rock and roll, um, and uh, the, and that song follows into a song called "I Took a Chance," uh, which just goes right on the heels of that, and it's a very straight ahead, McCartney esque song, uh, mid tempo, another great McCartney like bass line. I mean, you'd swear it was him, uh, mid mm-hmm. mid period Beatles. Uh, so they're also they're also terrific. Um, and, and I wanted to ask you guys about this one. I, you may have actually talked about this guy uh, at some point. Um, a group called, well, the, the group name was the Wise Guys Limited. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you know Chris Tasson? No? Um, no. Well, he's a Canadian Ringo impersonator, basically. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's. That's what it says uh, on the internet. There's a, there's a, there's a picture for you. Yeah, he kind of looks like him, sort of, kind of. Um, uh, so he he has this uh, this album called um, uh, "Looks Like Ringo, Sounds Like Ringo." Uh, he doesn't really sound like Ringo, but he's got a lot of Beatlesque elements in his music. And not only that, but Zach Starkey plays drums on the album. John Entwistle wow. plays bass. Georgie Fame plays organ. Uh, uh, Graham Lyle and Benny Gallagher, Gallagher and Lyle, sing on it. Billy Nichols, mm. uh, a lot of people you would have you would have heard of. Uh, DJ Fontana's mm. on there playing some percussion. Wow. Um, uh, you know, it's not the best album I ever heard, but it's uh, definitely enjoyable, and I probably have the only copy. Is my <laughs> is my guess, but um, it's you know it's fun. It's it's got its it's got its moments there. A group called the Red Button which is actually a duo, uh, a guy named Seth Swirsky, who put out a bunch oh, of albums. Oh, sure, you know sure. Seth? Oh, okay. yes. We know okay. Seth. Okay, uh, and then uh, Mike Rukberg, uh, who um, had an album called Acrimony and Cheese. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Acrimony and Cheese. Uh, and, and that first uh, uh, Red Button album is just, it's just a love letter to this kind of stuff. Um, She's about to cross my mind, uh, like a sort of. It could have fit in a hard day's night. Real sweet melody, lyrics, um, Harrison S. guitars, uh, and uh, Seth actually is coming out with a new album pretty soon. So uh, I'm sure that's once again going to be in that vein, since he seems to um, be in that vein most of the time. Uh, there was a duo named Dwayne and Jeff, and um, they had a, a, an album, a, a brother duo. Uh, a, a whole bunch of years ago, like maybe 14 years ago. Um, and uh, they n- not totally uh, Beatlesque, but they definitely have a lot of those elements in there. A song called Automatic Girl, Rickenbacker's Chiming, very melodic. Uh, one of the guys goes by the name Mr. Fish, and he's a political cartoonist, and he's been published everywhere you could think. Harper's Magazine, L.A. Times, Village Voice, Vanity Fair, all over the place. But um, they've only made one album and an EP, as far as I know, and nothing in over the last decade. So that's too bad. But uh, but I would encourage listeners to seek them out because they they really are fantastic. Um, mm-hmm. Let's see here. Um, uh, this is kind of sort of a, a good sad kind of story. A guy named Owsley, uh, Will Owsley, who yeah. Um, uh, he mm-hmm. put out uh, an album uh, in 1999 that was uh, on a small label, and then it was uh, remixed by Tom Lord Algae, uh, who did Jellyfish and other things. Uh, and it was reissued on Giant Records when they were around back then, part of Warner Brothers. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of very Beatlesque stuff on there, including a song called Sunny Boy, which is just like, could have been on Ram. You know, it's very, very McCartney. Um, and um, very sadly, uh, he died of an apparent suicide in 2010 at age 44. Uh, mm-hmm. Real shame, real, real. And I, I got to interview him, too. Um, he was just the liveliest, most passionate guy. Um, very sad. But, um, but anyway, that, that album is, is around, and uh, I think listeners would really enjoy, really enjoy hearing it. 
Um, Liverpool Echo. Uh, I don't know. If- <laughs> there's, there's a band with that name? Yeah, Liverpool. Well, it was one album. Uh, it has um, it had uh, Martin Briley in there, you know, who did the Salt and oh. My Tears and, yeah. mm-hmm. and other hits in the 70s. Uh, and a, a session bass player I'm sure you guys have heard of called Herbie Flowers. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. was in there. And, uh, you know, he played on uh, Jump Into the Fire from Nilsson and uh, Tumbleweed Connection, you know, sort of a bass mm-hmm. player to the stars uh, back in the 70s. Uh, but anyway, it's... As the title suggests, it's very Beatlesque. It was on Spark Records, a uh, song called "Girl on the Train," um, uh, very Mersey Beat, Sally Works Night, very early British Invasion uh, sounding kind of thing. Um, uh, something that some of the songs you would have thought McCartney wrote them. So it's oh. uh, that's not too hard to get. Um, that's that's a good one. Anyone with a Lennon, a strong Lennon influence. You know, I, I kind of stuck to McCartney there. It's harder to come up with the Lennon stuff for me, only because I've sort of fixated on the McCartney end of things for so long. Um, but um, uh, another one, and I, I'm sure some of you guys have at least have heard of these guys, is the Sponge Tones. Oh, mm-hmm. sure. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, early on, they were very Mersey Beatish, very Beatlish, um, and they got away from that after a while. But um, if you listen to their first album called Beat Music from 1982, it was just an exciting, vibrant gust of British invasion air, you know. Um, and it's 34 years old. It was hard to believe. But, um, but anyway, uh, um, Steve Stokel, the bass player, you know, he plays a McCartney bass uh, because you've got to keep it authentic. Here I go again on there. Just terrific. Uh, a part of me now. Just great, great, great stuff in there. And I was really lucky... Uh, back in 2000, uh, right before I stopped broadcasting from the radio station, they came into the studio and did an hour session live there for me, and um, that was quite a thrill. Um, and, uh, you know, they said on the air, you know, I said, hey, what about a Beatles song? And said, no, nah, we don't want to do a Beatles song. Then as soon as I s- turned the recorder off, they did a Beatles song. Steve, why don't you say it alone? How about some George Harrison-influenced music? Well, they're really, you know, like I said, aside from the Beatific track that is something, anything that I mentioned, I kind of really stuck to the McCartney side of things because that's kind of where I'm drawn most of the time. And I think it's more, it's easier to find, at least for me anyway, um, things that sound like uh, they have McCartney sound in mind than, than any of the other guys. You guys know a group called Los Shakers? No. No? Okay. No. Not off the top of my head, no. Well, <laughs> they were in the, in the 60s. They were um, from Uruguay. And uh, they, they there's a compilation on them on Big Beat Records called Por Favor. And they basically were the uh, South American version of Mersey Beat, essentially. Um, mm-hmm. they, they, they captured the early and mid-period Beatles and Mersey Beat sound. Uh, songs like The Child and Me, Everybody Shake which you can just imagine, I guess, how that sounds. Actually, that song sounds more like the Dave Clark Five than anything else. A um, <laughs> lot of uh, minor to major key ballads and mid-tempo ballads. Um, they should have been huge all over the world because they certainly were where they were from. But um, they just could. They had an album released in the U.S., but it just kind of died, unfortunately. But uh, uh, that compilation, I think, is still available called Por Favor and you guys would love that. I mean, anybody listening to the show would love it. Um, mm. oh. There's a guy uh, from uh, Spain called Ross. I can't remember his last name now, but uh, he goes by the name Ross. and um, He is very sort of yeah, he's just kind of Beatlesque sounding, McCartney-esque. Not always, but, but, but sometimes he is. And he had an album called Sugar that has an, a, a song called My Sister, which is... Very sort of early Beatles, um, great melody. Uh, this is from '96. This came out. Lots of guitars, and he was produced at the time by Ken Stringfellow from the Posies. So it's very accessible mm. um, and uh, quite enjoyable. And once again, it's got that flavor. Group called the Rockin' Berries from the '60s. Oh yes, them I know. Okay. Yes. Uh, and in fact, they did take a giant step. They did uh, the Monkey yeah. Song. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, and uh, it was previously released at the time it was on a compilation 
called They're in Town from 1998. Uh, they, mm-hmm. they have a lot of stuff that's uh, like very early to mid-period Beatles sounding. Um, that particular song, I think, was recorded somewhere in the mid-60s. Um, they were from Birmingham, England, uh, and they were actually formed uh, in the late 1950s. And they got their name because they played a lot of Chuck Berry songs in their set. So the Rockin' Berries, they were named. Um, and and you, this is interesting. Here, here's your sort of fun music fact here. At the beginning, they had very, very briefly, they had somebody named Christine Perfect. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Mm-hmm. Who everybody you know knows. who that is. Right. I know went, who that is. Right. Went on to Christine McBee. Yeah. Christine yeah. McBee, right. right. She was only in there for like five seconds. You batted an eyelash and she was gone. But um, mm-hmm. so they were together quite a long time. For all I know, they're still playing with the new guys, you know, over there in England mm. on the circuit. Uh, but uh, they're also a group that anybody who hasn't heard them would really enjoy them. Uh, a group called Cherry Twister, and uh, this is from an album they did their second. I guess it's a second mm. album from '99 called At Home with Cherry Twister, and not everything's McCartney-esque or Beatlesque on it, mostly McCartney-esque, but there's quite a bit of it on there. And they, they have a, a fast song, should have been a hit single, very McCartney-esque, called Mary Ann. Uh, they have great harmonies. Just if you like that kind of stuff, you know, like Al, you were saying, the kind of stuff you heard on Pure Pop Radio, they'd be, mm-hmm. they'd just be, you know, loved by everybody. Uh-huh. Hey, Alan, I, I wanted to ask you, um, obviously, you're playing it on your channel. What do you think of the new Emmett Rhodes album? Oh, I think it's fantastic. I think it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's interesting. It's not in line with the first two albums, with the self-titled album and Mirror, which are very, you know, sort of power poppy, I guess you would say. But the third album, uh, Farewell to Paradise, which I these days I kind of like as much or more than those first two records. This new album kind of is the album that probably he would have done had he gone on to record a fourth. Um, <laughs> the songs are very melodic and they're very enjoyable and they have a lot of good people, power pop people playing on there. Um, so uh, I, I think it's terrific. I, I highly, highly recommend it. It's a lot, a lot of fun. Great record. Yeah. And of course, your channel is the only one where you can hear it. Uh, well, I don't know about that, but uh, but I was on it pretty early. Um, mm. uh, you know, I, I uh, he there have been a bunch of times where he's almost made a record over the years, and then you know you would see a notice, well, it didn't come together, and you'd be like, oh man, you know. But this time, he did it, and uh, it's a it's a fantastic, fantastic record. A lot of the songs were written back then, just never recorded. Um, so uh, highly recommended if if you're a fan of that kind of music that's that's a great record yeah you guys are too young even alan's too young but there was back in the early 60s on wins there was a show called the mad daddy show that was on after uh, on after murray the k Mm -hmm. i've heard air checks yeah which was done by a guy named pete myers who eventually committed suicide Mm. and it was his voice was echoing just like this the whole show <laughs> well i actually re- remember that al i am of that age I, I i do remember that stuff yeah oh okay yeah i do remember that but, AB, but that AB... was intentional yeah oh yeah <laughs> yeah 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 it was and he was amazing because he had this long banter and everything rhymed and everything had to be written out and he said everything rapid fire pace you know everything was so fast off the top of off the top of his mouth, off the top of his tongue there. And he was amazing at what he did. Very skillful at it. Well, that was that era, you know, of, of yeah. uh, disc jockeys. I mean, uh, the Wolfman Jacks of the world, you know, who yeah. everything was off the top of his head. Um, you know, including the, the commercials, the live commercials he would do for to buy chickens through the mail. And, <laughs> and then they would show up at the houses and the chickens would be dead. Um, or he sold um, uh, pills that were, you know, th- to make you amorous, and all they wore were candy-coated aspirin, and he sold them for a buck a shot. And uh, all these commercials, no one was never like the next one. It, it, he just made all this stuff up and banged his palms on phone books and turned up the power on the transmitter and 
did all sorts of <laughs> unbelievable things. But that was, that those were the days. That's yeah. when being a DJ was an art form. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. It really was. Uh huh. It really was. It was fun, you know. They the jocks back then were as important or even more important than the music they played because all the stations played basically the same stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, and uh, so the way they differentiated themselves from everybody was they had shtick. You know, you had a guy like Dick Biondi who basically screamed, you know, um, uh, for a couple of hours. And, and uh, yeah. you know, so uh, they all had different styles. Gary Owens on the radio out in California who just mm -hmm. joked around you know, every day, you know, and, and he was another guy who thought off the top of his head. Knew every joke ever told, every bad pun, you know, he knew them all. Um, Dan Ingram? <laughs> Dan, yes. a Dan Ingram, yeah, yeah. I, I got to interview him once, and um, uh, he was a little skittish at the beginning. I think he just didn't trust journalists at, at the time. Mm. And um, I said, well, Dan, I remember when you said, and I just kind of reeled off about four or five one-liners, obscure one-liners that he, he'd done, and then he started laughing. And he goes, I did say those things. I'm so ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> That, was, That's like, that, that sounds like him, too. Yeah, that was. we were in this little production studio, and I thought it was, oh, boy, this is just going down to twos. But once I mentioned all that stuff, he was, uh, he was great. You know, he was so much fun. Uh, he was definitely a one of a kind. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of, all those guys back then were. Okay, uh, well, Ken is drowning in echo. I am going to uh, take over the... <laughs> very end of the show and um, thank uh, Alan Haber for being with us and for giving us a huge list of things to investigate at our earliest convenience yeah. um, uh, not to mention uh, all the information about the, the station which I think pretty much anyone who listens to this show would enjoy so until next week uh, Ken, can you tell us uh, in your echoey voice uh, what's going on with your show and uh, what you're giving away and that kind of thing? Uh, I have the usual Beatles trivia on my website. There's no echo this time, um, yes. including including Pure McCartney. And I have a new interview with Kid O'Toole, who is the author of the book uh, Songs Who Were Singing, uh, Guided Tours Through the Beatles' Lesser Known Tracks, who's actually going to be a guest on our show probably in a few weeks anyway. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, I'll be giving away copies of that through my trivia. And um, and that's basically it. It's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. Okay, right. and Steve, um, tell tell people where they can find your work now. They can find, well, you can uh, find my, uh, I mean, I'll have links on my Facebook page um, which isn't going to change. Um, I will continue to do Beatle news and commentary, um, and I will be I'm, I will be writing all over the place. Uh, the best thing to do if you're interested in me is follow me on Twitter. Which, by the way, I just uh, changed my Twitter handle last night from Beatles Examiner to my name, and it will it will say my name from now on. Um, so if you follow my name on, on Twitter um, or you follow my name on Facebook uh, or on Instagram or on Periscope, who knows what, what will be happening. But things okay. will be happening. Let's put it that way. Absolutely. And Mr. Sussman? Uh, you can contact me on Facebook at Al Sussman, uh, on Twitter at ASUSS49 or through Beetlefan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com or uh, www.paradingpress.com uh, for uh, Changing Times 101 Days That Shaped a Generation and for the 12 year olds who do the NPR Politics podcast. <laughs> and and uh, a couple of weeks ago did a show on musicals and politics and were totally bewildered about what the connection was between the Kennedys and Camelot. It's in the book. So, oh, my God. <laughs> Seriously? It's I, oh, so God. sad. Really? Oh, my God. <laughs> well, they're I young. Really the the, uh, the the twelve year olds reference I'm stole I'm stolen from Alan but uh, uh, it's true yeah. yeah wow okay and you can reach me on Facebook either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed 
Um, and you can write to all of us with comments, complaints, uh, stories, ideas, you know, for us to talk about uh, anything you want at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And you can follow us on Twitter. We are at sign things we said fab. So for Ken Michaels, Al Sussman, Steve Marinucci, and our guest, Alan Haber. I'm Alan Cozen, saying thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.